Headings just lubricate themselves. You just wind it and walk away. Thank you, sir. I just hope you're not thinking of giving up your regular work. I've no. got three barns to build this spring. No, so it's not true what I hear about you wanting to build a clock that you can use at sea? Impossible, sir. Clock needs a pendulum. Can't take a pendulum to sea. I'd like you to say impossible, John. No, sir. So that's it. A wooden clock. That's his claim to fame. It's the first accurate clock ever built. That's certainly one claim, but not the most important. It's the sea clocks. They're the masterpieces. And where are they? John and Groat? I don't know. I've, I've never seen them. Greenwich, I suppose. Am I keeping you awake? You are, not the music. You've made up your mind, haven't you? No. You mean you're not going? Not going where? To London. I didn't say that. You've found a way to build this sea clock, haven't you? With God's help, it might be possible. I mean, why did he encourage me to build a perfect timepiece in the first place? So the blacksmith might start work five seconds earlier or later. Or was it to give us the ability to explore his creation in safety? To move without fear in the space he's given us to inhabit? London is no place for a boy. Don't worry, he's old enough, and he'll be company. Take James if it's company you need. No, I need James to stay here in the workshop if we're to eat. Besides, as for William, I'm doing all this. 20,000 pounds. He'll be a gentleman. What does he need with money? <laughs> I wonder if you could have... No following disasters. At midnight, precisely, a rocket would be fired 3,000 feet in the air from each barge moored at intervals of 10 miles. Thus! Did you say moored? Yes, sir. The Atlantic Ocean is no more than two leagues deep at any point. Sailors over distances of several miles would be able to observe the rocket at precisely midnight London time. And knowing both London time and the time aboard ship, uh, excuse me, may calculate their longitude position simply and safely. How many of these barges do you propose? Um... 600, approximately. And who exactly is to fire these rockets? Her Majesty's Navy. Or, in time of war, patriotic citizenry. Anybody prepared, in fact, to live on a stationary barge in the middle of nowhere 365 days a year? And how exactly would these men be fed? Well, sir, the provisioning ships uh, would need to visit the barges on a regular basis. while I go in to see Dr. Rowley. I think it went quite well. Now, 
It is vital to my process, Sir Edmund, that each dog be wounded with the same knife. As these three animals have been under my instructions some three days ago. Now, the animals are then to be conveyed aboard one of His Majesty's ships uh, under the supervision of a designated officer whose task it is to prevent the wound from healing. The knife, however, would remain here in London and at precisely noon each day is to be plunged into the powder of sympathy, which would immediately aggravate the wound so that each dog, no matter how many thousands of miles away he may be in his particular vessel, would begin to howl thus. Um, the navigational officer on board each ship would therefore know instantly that it would be midday in London and would thus be able to calculate his longitudinal position accordingly. Get rid of them. Dr. Halley, there's one further... No more today. I've had enough longitude lunatics for one afternoon. I'm sorry, sir. Don't touch that boy. I didn't, sir. Honest. I was just looking. Do you know what that is? It's telling me to the stars. How do you know that? It's my job at home. You have one of these at home? No, sir. We use Mr. Johnson next door's chimney. And pray, what is it that you learn from Mr. Johnson next door's chimney? The time. How can you tell the time with the chimney? If you stand in the right place, you can see Sirius. Sirius? It moved behind Mr. Johnson's chimney three minutes and 56 seconds earlier every day. We need the time for our timepiece to tell if it's true. And is it? It's bloody perfect, sir. William. Bulb's gone. I'll go and find one. It's all right. I bought a torch. Who did you say you worked for? The hydrographer's office. Same as you. Well, if they were here, I'm sure I'd have known. Well, if they're nowhere else, it stands to reason that they must be here. Mr. Harrison, whatever the solution of the longitude, it will not be a timekeeper. George Graham's clock here at the observatory is the most accurate in Europe, yet it loses 33 seconds a month in the summer and gains as many in the winter. But I have two timekeepers at home, sir, accurate to one second a month that hold the same time, both summer and winter. How can you possibly tell? By celestial observation. Oh, of course, Mr. Johnson next door's chimney. I hope to persuade the board, sir, that I will follow. <laughs> and there is no board of longitude, it is never met. Now, do you know why? No, sir. Because we know the answer to the longitude problem, the stars. The only mechanism accurate enough for the purpose. When we have learned to map the heavens, we shall be able to chart the oceans beneath, and the longitude problem will be solved. Sir, I have some papers with me. Do you know Mr. Graham? No, sir. He's the finest instrument maker in Europe. If you indeed have a timekeeper as accurate as you maintain, he's the man you should talk to, not me. My secretary will write an introduction. I'll draw them a map, would you, Samuel? Yes. Goodbye, William. It's been a great pleasure making your acquaintance. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Harrison. Goodbye, sir.
Excuse me, I'm looking for the Astronomer Royal's office. There seemed to be some confusion at the gate as to where he was. You found him. Things are still